So uh, we're here to talk about how to make your research open and fair for those that are just starting out, but then even those who are, have some experience in making your research open, but want to learn about more about what others are doing. So we're gonna be going through the tools that we use and the best practices that we found after iterating, making mistakes, learning from others, and also why we do it. So we'll be talking about the motivations as well and whether that be for the benefit of greater science or trying to improve our impact on society. We'll be going over also with this current state of practices for conducting, analyzing, and publishing research when you wanna make it open and fair. My name is Caitlin Hall. I'm a grad student at Arizona State University. My name is Lieke Melsen. I'm an assistant professor of computational hydrology at Wageningen University. Hey, my name is uh, Niels Rost. I'm a research software engineer at the eScience Center in the Netherlands. Oh, I'm uh, Tim van Emmerich, assistant professor also at Wageningen University uh, in hydrologic sensing. And I'm Rolf Hutt. I'm an assistant professor at Delft University of Technology in the group of water resources engineering. Um, I'm a lead PI on the eWater Cycle project, which aims to verify hydrology, where Niels is also involved. So to start off, uh, we decided we thought we should actually talk about what is open and fair science and what those terms even mean. And we have some experts on this panel that um, are here to talk about it, particularly Niels, who will go through what fair science is, and Tim, who will talk a little bit more about what open science is. So sure. Uh, right, so fair. Um, I think um, everybody really uh, understands the need to, uh, for science to build off each other, uh, right? So this is the, the whole concept of standing on each other's shoulders. Uh, and for that, people have been sharing research results uh, for a, a long, long time. Um, and now actually what we're finding that in the modern age, we really need to up our game on this. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the, a number of people came together and actually came up with this concept of FAIR, uh, which is in the, um, in the context of, uh, of data for research, which is now becoming more and more important. And there they said, well, to make sure uh, your research is, is usable and reusable, uh, it needs to be fair, which in this case means uh, it needs to be uh, uh, findable, uh, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, and basically what they said there is that if you produce something in your research, other people should be able to use it. And uh, these were kind of guiding principles um, for uh, creating um, data that other scientists can then still use. Uh, Niels, maybe you can elaborate a little bit because I always find that uh, if I talk about fair science, the first letter I can, uh, I, I sort of, I remember and I can understand what it means. It needs to be findable. Yeah. And the other, the other letters, I always forget directly what they mean or how to interpret them. Yeah, I think this, this goes for everybody. Um, I think it's, for me, it's more of also sometimes a philosophy in, the, in, that, in that it's actually an acronym. Uh, but yeah, findable is uh, very much on, if you don't know data exists, uh, where will you ever be able to make use of it, right? So that's the first thing. You really need to make sure that this data you can find. Um, accessible then is kind of the next step. So you found out that this data exists, uh, that's nice, but you know, is there a link I can click on or is there some other way that I can get to my data? Uh, or to, to this data, can I download it? Um, and that's, Paywall, so that's, pay, paywalling, paywalling yeah. comes to mind. Right, it's nice that there's a link, but if you click on it and, uh, um, um, well, well, the paywalling is actually separate. That's the whole uh, fair versus open, right? So fair doesn't say it needs to be, um, that you need to be able to download it with a click. It says you need to be able, you need to describe well where you get this data, right? How to get to it. And maybe this is writing a letter to the ethics commission of some medical uh, uh, facility that actually stores this data because it's privacy sensitive. So it's not about making it open. It's it's about getting it accessible, describing how do I access this data. Um, and it's the same. So that's, but that's, that's quite interesting because if I think of accessible, it to me it feels like oh yeah, you know everyone should have access to it or you should mm. sort of grant access to the world. But that's not exactly what it means. It's basically no. just making sure you describe how. To access those data. Yeah, this is also because uh, um, the fair was also uh, uh, described uh, by quite a lot of people from the medical uh, community, 
which is one of the, the, the founding communities, let's say, of this FAIR principle. And that where there you really see the fact that, you know, you cannot just open somebody's DNA data, right? Or somebody's uh, scans that you made or other patient data that you gathered, but you still want them to be able to build, be built upon by other people. So why, that's why this accessible and the whole FAIR principles were really also meant for, uh, for privacy sensitive data and data that can, cannot be shared for whatever reason. Yeah, and then um, Niels, could you, I know that Lika and I have always like, we talked about this maybe like a year ago. We're like, yeah, it should be findable, accessible, interoperable. And we're like, yeah, it should be interoperable. We're not, we weren't entirely sure what that meant. Could you describe a little bit about what that means, particularly in the geosciences? Because I, since this was started more for like data, like what does this mean for geoscience? Yeah, so then, so I think the nice thing about the geosciences is there's quite a lot of knowledge already about how to uh, make something interoperable. So interoperable, again, is kind of the idea where you want to make sure that um, some other machine is able to read your data, right? If your data is just a picture, just a scan of a picture that you made of an Excel sheet, then it's kind of hard to still do anything with this information. Um, so then you still need to, to be able to better describe what this data is, not that here's the data, but also, okay, what's the format? Um, and then uh, even more for reusable, right? You really need enough references and enough information behind it to, to actually rely on this data to do something with it. So that's kind of the R. Um, and then where you really see in the geosciences, is where you have this awesome things like NetCDF, right? This is a file format made specifically to be able to better share data which already has uh, metadata in the format, right? You can see the author, you can even see the history of an NetCDF file, right? Why was this made and how? Um, so, so far, I guess I could understand the difference between fair and open. So we can say open really means it is accessible to everyone. Well, yeah. fair basically means it's accessible if you follow these rules or these guidelines that are provided to you, so you know where to find it. Because I mean, I'm I'm just a scientist doing my work, trying to be as open as fair and fair as possible. At least that's what I'm saying most of the time. But what I actually do when I write a paper, I use some data and I drop those data on HydroShare or on 4TU on a way to share it. What am I doing then? Am I I'm doing a little bit of open? How can I make it fair? I really I don't know where to start basically. Well, the, the nice thing about uh, these resources like the 4DU, uh, uh, but also other, other, other systems, is that they come with a, an index, right? So you kind of already start covering the FAIR, the F for FAIR, when just by putting them in, a, in, a, in such a repository, you know, other people can find it. Maybe it's still, you know, it's still quite hard maybe to find it in the 4TU data set if you don't know it's there. Right, so Maybe let me just break in. I, maybe we shouldn't forget that that all our uh, viewers are uh, Dutch geoscientists. So what yeah. is the for you? Oh, it's one of the many repositories that are around to share data. I mean, I yeah, guess the for okay. you, it refers to the Federation of the Four Universities of Technology in uh, in Delft, Twente, Eindhoven, uh, and uh, Wageningen. Yeah, but it's it's just like HydroShare, but then not specifically for hydrological data. But yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, well, another actually nice resources to use uh, is uh, um, the Zenodo, which is this also this awesome uh, open repository. Uh, which so is does that does that mean that at some point we just need a whole list of search places that we start looking for if we want to look for this? So I need to look at Zenodo, mm -hmm. Fortiu Data Center, HydroShare. At some point, I just need to know what's where, right? Isn't this like? dying by its own success? That's a very bad Dutch, Dutch translation. Well, well, for, for a part you're right, right? If they, just like, uh, if I tell you it is on the internet, uh, this doesn't help you much either, right? Um, so you still need hints uh, to know kind of where to go and what to look for, um, but it already uh, helps quite a lot that it's available at all. Uh, you also get these awesome things called DOIs uh, attached to most of these resources. Uh, which is also um, something you can then point to again in publications uh, when you tell people about this data. Uh, and this gives you a nice solid URL identifier thingy to give to people uh, so that they're sure they can they find it again. But then again, I'm, I'm wondering to what extent we as scientists um, 
well, first of all, how do we invest the time to prepare these data? But second of all, what I find myself doing very often is to share the process data. And to what extent should we share the source data? And to what extent should we actually share the model setup? I mean, I'm a computational hydrologist that do a lot of modeling. So there's, there's many questions involved with sharing there. Yeah, but so, but, but then again, that is kind of a uh, turtles all the way down question in this in the sense that um, I do a lot of experimental design of sensors, um, and 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 so related field work, which results in the data that you would consider as input data. So, do you want to have my raw measurements, and then should those raw measurements be in volts and amperage, and do you want to have the so there's a you can, can you maybe you can send take, me the sensor too that you used it'd be no, nice preferably yeah. so there's a there's a um there's a limit to what you would consider raw data or basically um someone's raw data is someone else uh, output and where do we set those limits i mean that's that's something i'm questioning when i share my data well, basically, I think what you should be able to show to your colleagues is the pathway from the data that you took that ideally also has a DOI, what you've did with it and what you resulted in it. And if that's, if that's a transparent uh, pathway where, you, um, where all the steps or both the, the data coming in is fair, the, you describe the process really well which I think leads us nicely to bridge into fair software. Um, and then you describe the resulting output data uh, and make sure it has a DOI, et cetera. Then if, then if that is all transparent, then uh, your colleagues can build on that with the trust that whatever you're claiming in your paper is actually what has happened to the data. Which brings up another nice point, I think, um, Niels started with like standing on each other's shoulders, but so far in science, we've always built on each other's conclusions. And now we're claiming that what we need is to build on each other's data. Do we actually need that? Or do we just like need to have the conclusion from someone and then gather our own data again? No, for me, actually, for me, really the motivation to share my data, where data, again, is a question like what's data and what's conclusions, of course, because model output, is that your conclusion? But I think uh, if you go back to where reproducibility comes from, because to me, FAIR um, contributes to reproducibility, and I think reproducibility is a core um, achievement in science that we should uh, maintain because, well, I guess it's most clear with doing measurements in the field. You can measure hydraulic conductivity, and uh, in the unsaturated zone, it will vary between sand and clay, and you can determine that the soil type actually has influence on hydraulic conductivity. But then if you repeat it again, and the soil moisture level differs, then you start no uh, noticing that actually the soil moisture content determines conductivities. So with rep repeating, uh, reproducing, or trying to reproduce conclusions, you can find out whether you are actually having any epistemic uncertainties, if you're missing any relevant processes. And I think, therefore, you should always build on, start with reproducing, see if you can rebuild these conclusions, and then continue building. I mean, that's why we need fair science in the first place, for this reproducibility. Well, I would, I would like to add that there's, I mean, making your data open and fair also allows for so many new avenues that you can explore with these data. So I don't think that, you know, if you collect data for one reason, sure, if someone needs to build on your conclusions, I think what you say, it's, it's completely, completely makes sense. But for example, the reason why I, or another reason why I make my data open and fair um, is that others can take the data and do something with the data that I don't have the time for or the energy or the inspiration to do. And uh, yeah, so far that, that, that did actually lead to quite some nice new fundamental insights in processes that, uh, that I would have never gotten myself. So just to make sure that I'm, I'm getting it. So Lika, your, your motivation for wanting to do open and fair science is to make sure that the science that we're doing is valid so that there's a greater understanding. Whereas Tim, you're looking to try and further ideas and try to like bolster like um, 
more scientific development or like yeah. like what other motivations do you, like you all have about like why you're doing open and fair science because i know that there are tons of different ways that not only just build up the scientific community but also go beyond and it's something that i know that offline we've all talked about a lot so what other motivations do you all have well i think one thing also to remember is that a lot of funders also see this 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 increase of reuse and this uh, um, um, other ways that society can make use of this data so that also it starts to also simply be a requirement uh, which maybe not never the best of best of motivations um, but I think oh. you really see the, the the funders really see like oh this is important we should promote this to uh, to such a point that it's just mandatory so uh, Nielsen and I talked to Maria Cruz and Hans de Jonge from uh, NWO, NWO, the Dutch Research Council, and we asked them why they, as a funding agency, why they, um, yeah, why they require uh, awardees uh, of grants to make their data uh, open uh, and, uh, and fair. Uh, well, NWO is uh, the major funding council in the Netherlands, so we have a budget of around 900 million euros a year, uh, which is uh, mainly spent on um, uh, funding uh, competitive research uh, um, projects, uh, but also on uh, research infrastructure, and NWO is also responsible for nine research institutes uh, in the Netherlands. At NWO, uh, we have a um, open science program where we work on, and and, and I think that we we have divided that in, in into three pillars. It's open uh, access publishing, it's open uh, or fair um, data uh, management, it's um, citizen science, uh, and then we have also a very important um, uh, ambition um, uh, that that's really trying to underpin um, uh, the open science movement uh, and is aimed at uh, changing the reward and incentive structures in, 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 um, in uh, science uh, and rewarding um, researchers for their uh, engagement with open science policies. Uh, uh, so the mission of NWO is to, um, um, to fund world-class world um, research that has an impact on science itself, but also has an impact also on society. Um, and I think um, in order to to realize that impact, it's just imperative to 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 um, to also to promote open science. Researchers should uh, not underestimate um, how big their audience uh, potentially can be. So it's not only the general pub public, uh, but it's also policymakers uh, around the world that want to, to, to learn and read about uh, um, uh, uh, the newest uh, uh, scientific discoveries. Also with the current epidemic, I'm really enjoying, well, reading, if I read a news story and it points to a paper, then I can actually, you know, I read a news story about the evidence uh, for you know, for and against school opening, and then I can actually go and read the paper, and I've done that. I've read those papers, and now there's no paywall. You know, you can anything on COVID, you can just read because most publishers have removed paywalls on those papers. I could say um, so. Our ba I mean, we we. So all uh, grants that are funded by NVO, uh, there's a, a requirement that uh, the papers coming out of uh, those projects uh, need to be need to be published uh, or made available uh, via uh, through open access, and uh, research data uh, also needs to be shared uh, not just openly but in a fair uh, manner uh, at the end of the project or. Uh, since uh, January this year, uh, underlying data should be uh, made available together with the publication at the time of publication. But, but that's really interesting to me because somehow indeed um, publishing open access makes sense, sharing your data makes sense. But then again, uh, Rolf's argument, what do I gain from 
putting everything. Yeah, and that's exactly, and and that's that's the other part of the package because um, NWO and not only NWO, other also uh, funding agencies and universities, uh, they are also shifting in their let's say assessment criteria. So as a scientist, it's not only the most important thing to have the most papers with the highest impact uh, factors, but it's about also shifting the way that we evaluate science and evaluate um, your uh, performance as an academic. And I think by having that shift, you can also really put focus and emphasis on different contributions that you make as a scientist. So whether it's replicating a study or uh, collecting data, making that open and fair, uh, that, that should be of uh, maybe a similar value or, or, uh, or assessment in the, in the end as having uh, that one paper in, in nature. I, I like the idea about that, but it has a hidden assumption. So, so basically what they're saying is they funders, we want to have impact with the research that we fund. We want this research to have impact in society or broader or whatever. Um, their assumption is basically by making it open, we'll have more impact than by not making it open and have scientists use the additional time to do more research. That is something that I wonder if, if that's been tested. Does making your science yes. open yeah. actually lead to more impact? Yeah, uh, yeah. so they, they actually mentioned some numbers and hopefully uh, we can maybe include this somewhere uh, in the YouTube at some point, uh, but they actually refer to some science uh, that showed that uh, not, open, not only open access papers, but also papers that are based on um, open and or fair data, I think, Niels, correct me if I'm wrong, actually have more citations in the end. And sure, more citations is still an old-fashioned way of assessing the impact of science, but that's what we have Don't so get far. me started. <laughs> so yeah, there is science, uh, there is actually science being done on this, I, I, and, and, and it just shows that, uh, that there is huge benefit uh, in, in, a, in a metric sense uh, to making your science area data uh, open and fair. Far, I mean, I, I get it. I get, I, I, it's really nice that there's a moving on from the funding agencies to stimulate this kind of science. And also, like there, there should be ways of, of funding reproducibility studies. But then I get the question, like for now, we've been building on 30-year-old data that has never been able to reproduce. I mean, try to reproduce a paper that's cited 5,000 times from the 70s. We won't be able to reproduce any of these, at least when it considers computational studies. So yeah. what should we do with all the knowledge we're building upon these days that we're actually not able to reproduce? I think well, that's a good question. Oh, well, maybe you have a better answer to this. But I, I mean, personally, I think it would be great if there would be more uh, opportunities for, science, for scientists to do, to just repeat these fundamental experiments or, or reproduce these fundamental conclusions that, uh, that were drawn in papers uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, but of course, you know, if there's no incentive and if there's no money, who's going to do it? Well, I'm, I'm pushing my own agenda because uh, eWaterCycle, the, the platform that we work on, is actually built to facilitate uh, reproducibility um, by design and allow people to build on previous research really easily. Um, but I think that we should make a, a judgment call on what historic research do we actually want to uh, reproduce because it's going to be a... well. If we just blanket say all historic research that doesn't share its data uh, is useless, then we should start by reevaluating gravity because Newton never showed its data. But I think, yeah, it still works. Um, so I think we can we can build on. Um, but that's because he, he described uh, his theory and his experiments in a way, right? So that's that's exactly you demonstrate how well he he made his science fair in a way. Yeah, yeah but I wanted to experiment. For sure. And I think that we don't need to redo every experiment. Um, I think that we can, by looking at which conclusions do and don't hold, both within their original context and in the broader context, we can maybe pinpoint to some studies that are problematic that we would really want to revisit to test if, they're, um, if they still hold up or if we're building on uh, faulty knowledge. But, but I then, think that would be great. So, I, so for, from personal experience, I, I remember, I'm not going to say which exact field and what exact papers, but I 
no, no, names, James. <laughs> it's also because I forgot, okay? Okay. <laughs> so I remember that I was, uh, for, for some hydrological modeling study, I was looking for, I was looking for a parameter value. And I, uh, I found a paper that used a specific value and I thought, like, okay, I'm going to use that too. Uh, like there was some reason to do that and I used it and everything was fine. But then I started questioning, you know, my decision to use this parameter value. And I was looking at the paper I got it from to see where they got it from because they didn't, they didn't measure or get it themselves. But they there also referred to some older paper, which referred to some older paper all the way back to, you know, some random, random, paper in some random journal that arbitrarily cho chose this value uh, to build their model on. And, and I was just so surprised that no one really sort of checked or, or validated or, re or, or did this again to just confirm that this is a, a realistic value to, to put in your hydrological models, since it was such a crucial value in the end. That's, bas that's basically how we got the 0 0.05 thresholds, right? Like someone once said, Oh yeah, that'll be a nice one. And then everybody said, he said it was nice, so we should use that. And, you know, and sometimes it's a, it's a nice quick fix, but it's clear. I mean, there are so many, uh, I mean, constants that we use in science uh, just because they fit the model and they, and they sort of tie everything together, but it's clear where they come from. Well, it's interesting, Tim, that you had that experience because I had exactly the same, eventually leading back to unpublished work so it's not anecdotal evidence actually independent from each other we had such an experience like looking back tracing back where things come from and well especially if you consider the 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 large amount of, of decisions that we make while setting up a model i mean we're talking about modeling studies now specifically right so that's a specific branch of hydrology of course there's there's so much that actually really urges the sharing how you set up your model how you decide that all those values and actually that's why we need a platform like eWaterCycle because you can share your data and you can mention the version of your model but then there will still be so many details that you won't share that still hamper reproducibility of your model study. Yeah and I think that like this also goes beyond just hydrological modeling. I was talking about this literally yesterday like about how this like one method has just been accepted and how we use this a lot of hand waving during uh, numerical analysis of physical modeling and uh, physical experiments because we're like well this person this really famous person did it like 40 years ago so it's got to be right and i think that really starts to highlight why like not only just our manuscript should be open and fair but also that the process of like getting to these manuscripts and like not just like that initial data that I think Lika was talking about with like you go in you take a measurement in the field but also the process of getting to what that manuscript output is like actually showing like how did you get these values where did where did they come from so then if we're using these really I don't know just field accepted values then at least we're like acknowledging that they might be arbitrary but at least then it's not we don't have to go through like four or five different uh, reference papers to get to that point. And I think that that starts to really highlight what assumptions we're making and will ultimately like help science. But then as we've been talking about taking this open and trying to get it more fair, like this one arbitrary constant might not mean anything to someone that's um, trying to make a policy decision or that's working for like a government because they might not have as much access to these other papers. So then I think that also really highlights why it could be important for beyond just like our own research. Well, there's, this sparks two thoughts, but let's follow up on the last one. Do we expect- oh, yeah, that one. Yeah, that one. Do we expect then, so in the geosciences, we're doing research where a lot of policy is based on. That has impact on the way we shape society, the decisions we make. Do we expect people that make these decisions to like read our papers and go, hmm, yeah, Klingupta efficiency of 0.6. This is a hydrological model I should trust. Or actually look at my Python code. To no, absolutely not. But like they're working with scientists that are informing policy, like the, the science that's being done and like people are reading the papers that we're putting out that eventually inform policy, but they should, the people that are that link between our academic studies and the ultimate 
output of policy should at least know where our information is coming from. And that should be a lot more clear. And so the, the thing is, how do we build a system where people without having to read everyone's work can know like who to trust or which papers have more if we if we take it back to geo and hydro um at some point i will say to some of my phds go and look at these papers be very critical um and then if you're if you're convinced that whatever they're doing is okay start building on that i will retire hopefully soon, whatever, that, so my PhDs will have their PhDs. Will they say to their PhDs, go look at these papers again, be very critical again? At some point, we would just say, okay, these papers, we've been checked, and they've been found to hold up. You're referring how to this, eh? Yeah, so how, do, how yeah. do we communicate, but how do we communicate that? How do, we, how do we communicate that system of trust as a community? Because now it's very intangible. And, and, but, and how about and likes? Ratings, have like likes on it. Yeah. The likes and don't likes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but the papers and the review process. You're doing this check, right? That's why Earth Archive. I mean, it's nice, but it's not necessarily something you can trust. Well, if something has been peer reviewed and published, you sort of hope that it fulfills current standards in science. So three people have looked at it have read the conclusion, have checked whether they were cited themselves and have then vouched for it. Mm -hmm. uh, I read, so I know some papers from my early career that if people go through it very carefully, they'll probably find bugs in the code that I hope will not have an impact on the final conclusion. But that's um, the point. Everyone has bugs in their codes. Every model has bugs in their It doesn't matter if you're working with a model that was developed 30 years ago, there will still be bugs in the code. That's for sure. Part. So, so a, the, 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 the current peer review system by three people who do not actually not have the time for it, nor the incentive to do it right, will not help in building that system of trust. So I think we need something else. And maybe, maybe it's just likes and dislikes. I don't know. Um, but we got to have something to help scientists make a judgment call on is this something I need to reproduce before trusting it or is this something that has been reproduced a gazillion times we're we're okay maybe maybe, maybe maybe an article should just have a counter of number of uh confirmed how oft, yeah how often yeah. it has been reproduced yeah well maybe maybe at least you should make sure that reproducing like the computational side, which is kind of the easy part, right? Doing measurements again is hard, but the, the computational side, we should at least be able to just press a button and get it to run again. Does it mean that we need to adjust the definition of fair for software versus data? Yeah, I don't think it's quite the same. I think the what I spoke at the beginning that we have this kind of fair philosophy almost that it doesn't matter what the letters mean, but it's this, it is way of thinking. And I think this way of thinking really translates well into software. Uh, but the actual steps, right? Uh, what is findable software is maybe something you can think about a bit, but what is interoperable software? Um, it's a very different, you'll get a very different set of actually concrete things uh, and problems. Uh, that you I, have, I have some computer science friends that would say that software is never interoperable because even if you run the same software, the same computer a second time, you'd have bit fluctuations because of Boltzmann noise in your random generator. Yeah, so you get a different Sounds like RGIS. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so actually from uh, um, at the eScience Center, we also thought about this, to how, how would FAIR kind of translate the software. You actually made a site, uh, fairsoftware.nl, uh, which uh, although it's NL, it's not actually in Dutch or uh, exclusively for a Dutch audience. But it's the in link, the uh, Find the link uh, below. Uh, and then we really try to get like uh, first steps towards making uh, software FAIR. Um, so make sure, it, like, make sure it's somewhere, with, you know, in this case, probably GitHub or, or some other, data, you know, software repository. Uh, uh, put a license on it. It's also an interesting one, right? Because it's also uh, just like data has licenses, software also has licenses. Um, and some other ways to, to try to, you know, get to the first steps. But you're right, uh, some things, uh, uh, if something depends on the no random number generator in your computer being nice and toasty when you compute it, uh, then it's going to be a problem. Well, it's also, I think, one of the big differences is that. Um, if I can read the ones and zeros from old data, or maybe even like the 
the printed table form from old experiments, um, I can reuse the data. But if you give me old uh, Lotus one, two, three, what was it called? Spreadsheets. I don't think I have a machine anymore that can read those. And I, I feel that the turnover time for, for that in the software world is pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah, it's a problem. Uh, the, the, you have to actually start thinking about packing in the, the software environment, not only the software, right? So here's the code, this helps. Uh, try to make your code adhere to like sta quality standards, like don't use uh, some library nobody has ever seen uh, to do all the math, right? Do that with some kind of standard thing. Maybe that survives a bit longer, but yeah, maybe you need to just package a whole virtual machine with your software, uh, ideally. Um, it's actually the same for data, actually. People are struggling to read AD's data, uh, uh, be it on tapes or actually online, but also the data formats that they used. Um, yeah, it's a, I think it's a constant uh, struggle. I think it's up to those young uh, starting early career scientists, uh, almost mid-career scientists, um, to make a good selection of the work of that previous generation to see uh, which we should really scrutinize and try to reproduce. Um, but then in the way we're doing this replication, we should make sure that at least the replication is again reproducible, making sure that all the code is available, making sure that all the data is available um, for others to build on. And maybe by doing that with some key papers, I'm really pushing my own agenda here. Maybe by doing that by some, with some key uh, papers, um, we can start building trust that some of that collection of work is actually worthwhile building on and some of it should be discarded. Um, I guess that's the progress of science to, to falsify stuff eventually. So even if we if retest we old work, we can decide that maybe a couple of years research has been wasted on the wrong assumption, hopefully. Of course, one of the problems is that we don't really have controlled experiments and geosciences is too complex to really. And, well, and I, I also think that if you take, if you look at the physics um, world, the, the popular opinion about dogma shifts is, is usually that oh, this was completely wrong. And now we're thinking this. Whereas what usually happens is for this stretch of domain, this happened to be truth. And then we started looking outside of it and it turned out to be different. And I think that in the geosciences, that's more true than ever, because I'm pretty sure that Darcy's law will continue to hold up for uh, nicely uniform sand baths. Uh, we already know it doesn't hold up for inhomogeneous weird stuff and that you cannot blatantly use Darcy for 10 kilometer pixels in a global grid. Um, but yes, this is where science versus engineering comes in, right? For sure. That we kept on using these kind of, or we keep on using these kind of concepts because it works practically. Yeah, well, and we're what the, in, with that respect, um, we're we're in a field where we're not only asked how it works, we're also asked to make predictions or to to come up with data that policy can actually use, and sometimes that means you're constrained and you have to come up with an answer. Uh, I can see the tension there. Yeah, but then just to come back to, to Tim's question, because he asked actually the right question. Who's going to do all this? I mean, we know now we, we, we like to check all the knowledge that we build upon. And from now on, we should make our knowledge that we create available to everyone, fair and open and reproducible. Um, but then I hear Niels explaining, oh, maybe we should also store the software environment. I mean, I'm not a software developer. Who's responsible or who's taking care of sharing the data? And how are we going to do that? And I think that we've but also think, yeah. the fact that Sorry, this is coming up to early career scientists as well, because like we're the one, like early career scientists are the ones that are starting that are pushing a lot for this process now because of like the mid and more experienced career scientists are like, yes, we should be doing these things. But then I think you're right that it does come back to what Tim was saying that like the onus is then on the people coming in rather than the people leaving as well. And like at what, like who should be doing that as well. I only I guess, I guess we are also the ones that are still, you know, we can, we can be molded a little bit more easily. Like we're not so rusted in our behavior and way of doing, especially the, the ones who are just joining academia, of course. But I, I think in, that... In the end, it's just a, it's, it's a shift of mindset. You know, if, yeah. you, if you start early and if you just understand that this is an, 
integral part of doing science. You can do it right. You can do, do it open. You can do it fair. I, so then how can I, I, agree, I agree with all of that, but it's for the old outgoing generation to create the environment where you can actually do this and be rewarded for that. It's the old outgoing generation that has the air of the funding agencies and the policy setters. Um, it's, it's nice that we have and that a is few, changing. I mean, yeah, we have no, the DORA I, declaration, of course, that is uh, yeah, no, and, quite and, and I think that's really good that universities are signing that. And I think it's good that funders like NWO are actually starting to mandate these kind of things because having a few champions is nice to start a culture shift, but you'll always need some stronger incentives in place to get the bulk majority of people to change the way they're doing well, their work. Just anecdotal, I got some feedback on a proposal and uh, the, like, uh, basically it was written like, ah, you know, the idea, I'm not so sure, but all his, all his papers are published open access, so it must be a great scientist. <laughs> she got me to the, to the next round, so, you know, yeah, uh, reputation, there's, reputation, there's reputation. there. So then um, I guess, like, how can the, the communities how can the community specifically be supporting this? So in addition to having these open and fair champions as these experienced scientists, but like what specifically can the community start doing to either promote this? Like let's say that they are experienced scientists, like what can that group specifically be doing to support this? Well, in, in addition to only the scientists, it's also the universities, right? So in, in many universities around the world, uh, I know more examples in Europe specifically, the libraries play a key role here because the libraries, they know how to make your, how to get your uh, papers published open access. They know the mechanisms to get additional funding if necessary. And because I find it interesting you mentioned universities, it's also us as lecturers, the responsibility to where they have the next, I mean, how old are we? But there's a next generation waiting there to already inform the next generation that's now taking their master course to inform them on these principles. Uh, as reviewers of other people's paper, we should just blatantly say, this data isn't open, this should be rejected. This uh, software isn't reproducible or whatever, this should be rejected. And you can, you can be nice about that in the way you communicate it, of course, especially if you have some experience, you could say, look, this data isn't open, please use the steps here to uh, openly publi uh, publish your data as well. Um, and make that part of your standard review routine, uh, which I do before I go into the actual content. Um, yeah, there was, there was a, an editor uh, who, who did that, who basically every time when a paper was submitted that that editor needs to handle, uh, they asked like, okay, share your data. And yeah. I think about 30% of the initial submissions directly withdrew their paper because of that question. Yeah, well, in that case, there. Well, I, I I like him that an editor puts out his neck. Is that Dutch? I think it's Dutch. But that puts out his neck. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Um, to uh, to force that change, if that's the culture you want to support. Um, and also, I Dutch think I think there's also uh, um, also a matter of leading by example. Uh, and also, yes. I think the early uh, uh, career scientists can really uh, start to help out by also actively asking uh, uh, everybody around them in their groups, say, hey, why aren't we making this open? Why isn't this public? Shouldn't we publish this data? Shouldn't we open access everything? Right, look, I found this policy on the university. It actually said we should. So why aren't we doing this, right? So I think it's also a, a matter of, of talking about it and uh, promoting this also, however, um, in whatever group uh, you are. Um, and I think also the, f the first few steps in, in making things fair and open shouldn't be that hard, uh, right? It's, 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 you know, put your data on, uh, on a, on a preprint service, uh, make sure your code is available somewhere. Um, if only on your website or put it in a, in a, uh, put it in GitHub uh, somewhere. Yeah. And what y'all were talking about, about also making sure that like we're promoting those practices, like in proposals. So like, not just the like, okay, we have all this data, what are we going to do with it now? But making it intentional, I think also make this process a lot easier for people who have some experience in this or are just starting up to like start with the intention that your data, your software, your data analysis processes, like are going to be open and fair. So I think that all that also makes it a lot easier to do rather than having to 
do a bunch of cleanup at the end and hoping for the best. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, also be honest about that it takes time. It costs time and money to do that. And it's perfectly okay to in the planning of your proposal, of your research project, to, to intentionally and explicitly preserve time and funding to make your, your data and your software and your code uh, open and fair. A lot of the things that funders actually do is they only fund hours for researchers. So I get money for, I put in a call, I get some money. The only thing I can do, and either it's because my university doesn't allow me or the specific call doesn't allow me, the only thing I can do is hire a PhD. It would be really nice if I could just say, look, within this call, I want to hire a PhD that's going to study this and this and this, and I want to have 10% support from a research software engineer or from a data champion that is going to help this PhD out with making a data management plan for whatever she or he is doing. Uh, I want a research software engineer that makes sure that the code that this PhD is writing is up to the standard for sharing it so that others can use it. Um, and that is also something that funders can uh, allow and push for. I agree. All right, so if we don't have anything else that we want to add. Good, and if you don't know what to do, talk to your library. Uh, you know, you can always reach out also to one of us if you need suggestions on, you know, how to pay for your open access fee, how to make your data or your software open if they're, uh, we're there, if you use their, your library. Find a, find a journal that doesn't have an open access fee, but it's just open by design and doesn't overcharge you and doesn't have, doesn't build on a 40% profit margin. Yeah, and so we'll be sharing different um, ways that like people listening in can uh, put their data up in an open air, uh, open location or put preprints to get feedback, um, different softwares that are already open and fair so you don't have to start from scratch. And uh, we'll be sharing those as well so that it's always really hard to find answers to a problem with Google if you don't know what to search for. So we're gonna at least start um, a launch pad for that. But I think Tim brought up a good point that we're always available for these types of questions, but also there are a lot of open and fair champions in the geosciences already. And so they, like, there's already a really strong community and support for this. Um, it's, it's definitely not something that anyone needs to start alone nor from scratch. Well said. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much.